John Kelling was a man who was well known here in this rural area of Beaver County, where he lived in a dilapidated trailer. He was considered eccentric by some of the kinder folks around Georgetown and a deviant by others. He had few friends in this area. He had been a victim of past assaults. He also had a roommate who was mentally ill, had a propensity for violence, and had a criminal history. When Kelling was found beaten to death outside his home on August 23, 1975, evidence was scarce and people willing to talk about it was even scarcer. Police think they know who killed Cowling, but they still need help to officially close the case. I'm LeVar McBride, and this is Cold Case, Beaver County. You got three people of interest still say, I do. Three people of interest, then you get that blank face. Now that's why nobody really knows if she is dead or alive. He was set free and he was set free to go kill. We've never gotten that one break. We've never gotten that one break. You know, we will though. 66 year old John Cowling lived along Georgetown Road in a trailer that was run down and surrounded by debris. The police were familiar with him because he had been a victim of harassment and assault. Well, he was well known in the area of. Uh, in the West Virginia and Ohio, uh, uh, kids were always harassing them. Or, uh, there was a lot of problems there. We had uh, responded to the patrols, had responded numerous times down there for harassment, what have you. I believe he uh, uh, was known in, uh, as a homosexual down there, and uh, that uh, created more problems. The two individuals, I think, were charged uh, with an aggravated assault uh, uh, with, with Mr. Cowling. There was another side of Cowling that few people bothered to see. Pastor William Hemp was a teenager when he met Cowling. Back in 1968, my mom and dad bought this farm and it was right behind us up on a hill, 52 acres. And I was a young fella. And my dad had bought me a mini bike to break the boredom for me here because I had moved from Hopewell. I had lost all my friends and uh, believe me, this is out in the country. One day I was riding on the trails back on the farm and I ran across this old fellow uh, working in his gardens. His name was John Cowling and it was uh, cold out because he was planting snow peas. Hamp with his new mini bike discovered he had something in common with Cowling. Uh, periodically I would ride down and get the mail and I would uh, see John, he would be out on the road there and um, he had told me, he said, uh, I have motorcycles of the old Harley Davidsons. Well, I was a motorcycle enthusiast and um, I was interested. So uh, I'd stopped in and uh, he would show me all these books. Hamp also quickly realized Kelling was rather eccentric. He uh, started talking to me about astrology. Well, I didn't know what astrology was back then. I knew what the moon and stars was, but he started mentioning, he asked me, he said, what's your date of birth? And I said, 11, 17, 51. And he said, you're a Scorpio. Well, I had no idea what that meant. I wasn't interested in that, but that's how I first met John. But he was uh, quite a unique person. Very smart, very smart. Cowling had a roommate, 39-year-old Roger Fulweiler, whom he met at Massillon State Hospital in Massillon, Ohio. Fulweiler spent time in state prison for sexually assaulting children. He was also diagnosed as having sociopathic personality disturbance with a sexual deviation. He was known to be violent. A caregiver at the group home where Fulweiler once resided described him as vicious and sadistic. It was believed Cowling asked Fulweiler to move in with him to provide protection because of the past problems with harassment and assault. His protector was likely his killer as well. The roommate, I guess it was, was uh, made the initial call. And the uh, night patrol had gone down there and, and we were contacted to uh, respond. It was one of the first uh, homicides that uh, I was involved in as a supervisor. That, uh, uh, this occurred in a very isolated area at, uh, outside of Hookstown and uh, wasn't much much to work with there. Uh, the place was 
pretty much a trash place, I guess. Uh, it wasn't uh, very neat. Well, the deceased was laying on the ground uh, outside the uh, mobile home on his back. Uh, shirt was pulled up. Uh, you could see uh, some marks on him. But, uh, uh, at that time, we didn't know what, what actually the cause of death was. But uh, later determined it was a result of a blow to the head that uh, he uh, died from. With all the trash and everything, uh, it was a little difficult. To, we did, didn't find what we felt would be a murder weapon, but uh, uh, there was stuff strewn all over the place. Coroner Harper Simpson was called to the scene. When I got here, the, the scene, it was the middle of the night, probably 3, 3.30 in the morning. Came up here, very dilapidated trailer, a lot of junk and debris laying around with a dead body laying just about in this area um, on what passed for a porch uh, for the trailer. The man um, in his 60s uh, had obviously been beaten to death with a, with a blunt force instrument. Uh, he had a lot of broken bones, uh, fractured skull. Um, he was laying in a small pool of blood. Didn't seem to have any open wounds like knife wounds or bullet bullet wounds or anything, so he was severely assaulted, severely assaulted. Police focused in on Fulweiler. Well, a number of leads were checked out. Uh, uh, his roommate uh, turned out to be the prime suspect in the thing. Fulweiler, however, proved to be tough to figure out. Uh, he was a little slow mental, uh, and uh, they did uh, run a polygraph. He was deceptive as far as the polygraph was concerned, but uh, there was nothing, nothing to really pin it on them. Uh, he uh, vehemently de denied any involvement uh, during the whole investigation. And, uh, it, it, was, it was hard to talk to him. Uh, you couldn't get a straight answer. He, he'd give you a, a yes, no, uh, uh, wouldn't elaborate on anything. Uh, it, it was difficult to deal with. Police were left with no murder weapon, no evidence, no witnesses. There was suspicion from some people that money could have been a motive which may seem surprising given Cowling's lifestyle. He had a fabricating shop. I learned this later on, just recently. I learned this later on that he had a fabricating shop. He had employees. Supposedly, uh, uh, he had quite a bit of money, but he lived eccentric. Unbelievably, uh, you would say that man couldn't, uh, it was poor as a church mouse. Police were never able to get any useful physical evidence or find anyone willing to provide them enough information to close the case. Fulweiler died in 1981. Now, more than 40 years later, people are still unwilling to talk about Cowling's murder. You know, I, I've been shunned by people, as some of the elders that lived here at the time, I mentioned it to them, I don't want to get involved. Let it go. It's done. No, it's not done. This murder is not solved. Somebody knows something. Even if the murderer is deceased, somebody knows something. And it's eaten at them, and they have it blocked out. This may bring it out. I hope to God it brings it out. I pray it brings it out.